good evening, depending on where you are. Thank you so much for joining us today for our continuing professional development room for digital asset management that's brought to you by the Henry Stewart Group. My name is James Lockman. I'm a cloud architect at Adobe, and I'll be your guide today to our program. And before we get into introducing our speakers for today, I'd like to go over a little bit of operational business. You should see on your screen a questions area. It should be uh, either over to the right or the left. Um, take advantage of that. You've got some smart folks here in the room that are going to be talking to us uh, today, and you have an opportunity to talk to them. So please use that question box. We will read those um, as we go along or at the end, depending on what makes the most sense for the flow. And then um, we'll all get to learn from your questions. Secondly, we hope that you had a great time and joined us at DAM New York. If, in, you, in case you didn't know, DAM Europe is coming up. It's in London the 28th and 29th of June, and we look forward to seeing you there. So please join us in London for, those, uh, for that event. The last bit of business is that as you're going along, I know you want to take notes, and there's going to be things that you want to hear again. That's awesome. We're going to send you a recording of this event. So for having come today, one of the benefits of coming today is that you're going to get a recording. We're going to send it out by email. So don't worry. You'll get that email tomorrow with a link to the recording. So yes, take notes. But if you miss something, don't worry. You'll have an opportunity to review. So have all of that out of the way, let's focus on today's bit of business, which is DAM at the speed of business, helping ASICs run faster. And our presenters today are Paul and Kristen. Now, Paul Legan is a managing partner and a member of the senior leadership team uh, at TreeShare. He's responsible for growing their capabilities in areas of digital marketing and analytics. He's got experience working with some of the world's largest brands, including Polycom, ASICs, F5 Networks, Caesars Entertainment, and a whole lot more. Now, prior to joining TreeShare, Paul implemented global technologies for Bern, uh, Behringer Ingelheim. Kristen Jones, who's the Director of product, uh, Project Management, she's responsible for overseeing project management and Adobe Experience Manager best practices for TreeShare projects. She works closely with the team on providing customer care and ensuring client satisfaction. She joined 3Share from Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, where she gained several years of experience with enterprise software and internet uh, intranet technology solutions with a strong focus in website and digital asset management implementations. So now that you know a little bit about Paul and Kristen, I'm going to hand it over to them. And don't forget about your question pod. So Paul and Kristen, take it away. Thank you, James. I appreciate that introduction. Um, before we get into the meat and potatoes of the presentation here, just a very quick overview of who we are at 3Share. So at uh, 3Share, we're an Adobe Business Level Solutions Partner, and we are a consultancy um, primarily based on supporting and implementing custom solutions for the uh, digital uh, Adobe Digital Marketing cloud of products. And our experience spans a variety of um, key verticals, but um, we've been fortunate enough to work with several companies on their digital asset management implementations. So again, welcome everyone. Uh, I'll, I'll get right into it. So why we're here. Uh, 3Share and um, Kristen and myself specifically have had the opportunity to work with uh, ASICs both in America and abroad in Japan and Australia. And uh, ASICs came to us several years ago with a couple of very key uh, business challenges. First of all, uh, like many uh, organizations across the, the world, they had a variety of unorganized assets. Uh, they had over 40,000 of them to begin, and by the end of the actual migration, we had found several hundred thousand more across different regions and across different groups of people within the organization. So again, like most organizations, there were a significant amount of assets lying around, many duplicated, duplicated across different uh, departments that we needed to sort through and figure out how we could um, manage them in one central location. Uh, the second business challenge was a very slow and cumbersome process to upload assets, uh, generate uh, renditions or variations of a particular asset. Uh, 
and and then also how to distribute those assets to the people who really need them uh, to support their business. And then the third business challenge was essentially around the data um, within their digital assets and surrounding their digital assets and how it was used. So not only were their organizations using assets that were out of date, but we didn't even know, they didn't even know where those assets were being used across their entire platform with tech of technologies. So when ASICs came to us, they were very similar to a lot of organizations, again, in these three challenges that uh, we needed to figure out how to solve for. So from an implementation standpoint, we had very clear goals. The first of which was to decrease time to find and share assets to retailers. So remember, ASICs doesn't make a lot of money if their retailers don't have access to great marketing material or artifacts to create great marketing material in order to resell their products. So that was key goal number one. Number two, they wanted to consolidate brand assets from multiple systems. There was a lot of reuse, uh, or ability for reuse across organizations, but unfortunately they just had no reporting and no idea of a, a sort of catalog around which assets could be used where. And then finally, there were several people within ASICs dedicated exclusively to providing retailers with the assets that were needed to support their marketing campaigns. So this was something that was tedious, time consuming, and certainly something that could be automated through a tool. And so that was the third implementation goal, to enable retailers to be self-sufficient. Let's step back for just a second and talk a little bit about digital asset management at its core. Everything begins with an asset, or 10,000 assets. In fact, most assets have related assets or artifacts that were used to create that, that asset. So when you think about, let's say, a, a PDF file, it's very likely that there are graphics inside that PDF file that can be reused across other PDF files. And it, it's a slippery slope from there, and you'll kind of find that there are packed away in shared drives and in the most remote servers somewhere in a different part of the world, there are probably assets that you need or could use in your own work day to day. Now, each asset has a set of metadata, and uh, often that metadata comes in a variety of formats. Now, fortunately, people smarter than myself have taken the liberty of organized that metadata into separate and very specific metadata formats. So you may be familiar with IPTC, XMP, there's a variety of different standards and they're used across the creative suite of products within Adobe's product suite, but they're also used in general across most applications that deal with digital assets. So a DAN solution, if you're considering one or if you're considering moving from one to another, a DAM solution should definitely be able to make sense of all that metadata for you. And of course that takes a little bit of planning, but the ability to read embedded metadata in an asset as well as write metadata back to that asset when it's edited somewhere within a native application is very important to the success of not only an ingestion of assets, but also to an overall management of those assets later on. A DAM solution should provide several ways to upload assets. This was very key for ASICs and is very key at a lot of the companies we work with where the, the barrier of entry to a user within the company being able to upload and organize their assets, it really kind of depends on, on what that person does. So some people from a more technical perspective prefer things like command line tools or um, FTP clients or other other software that's sort of more technical driven, but a creative, perhaps a creative person or some person who is in um, management and wants to get at access for a PowerPoint presentation, assets for a PowerPoint presentation, they may not want the same interface. So they may want something that looks more like Finder within OSX or just a web browser. So it's very important that a DAM solution provide different user interfaces to the same assets. In the case of ASICs and in the case of other organizations, uh, there are a variety of different ways 
that we've seen people connect to the dam, and these were the most important that we found. So first, web dev, the ability to make a shared drive look like it's just an extra drive on your computer and you can access files sort of transparently, or, uh, abstractly there. Second is browser-based uploading. A lot of times we only have a browser or we're using sort of a thinner client. Um, and so therefore, browser-based uploading and organization is very important. Thirdly, there are some native applications that companies offer that interact with their dams. And this is also important when speed is a, a concern, especially when you have a, a bulk upload of certain types of assets. You may want to have a, a dedicated app to do that. But finally, and this is something that we took full advantage of in terms of the ASICs case, um, there's often a REST API that's provided, some advanced way to get at all the information in, the, in, the, in any sort of asset repository that can be custom built or we can use the API to custom build external applications that hook right in. And this last option is, of course, where things get very interesting. When you approach an asset migration like ASICs, where you have hundreds of thousands of assets, and oftentimes you don't even know how many assets you have at the start, but we like to take advantage of what we call processing profiles, but there's a variety of different names for it, but essentially the ability to automate tedious tagging on newly updated, uh, uploaded assets. So for example, there's a significant number of metadata fields that are embedded within a PDF or a Photoshop document already. And those pieces of information can be extracted. But let's say you have a folder structure as well that gives meaning to the assets. This is common in a variety of cases. And in the case of ASICs, when a photographer would upload a shoot of all the latest products for a particular um, campaign or a particular season, they often organize those assets into folders. And it's clear what properties apply to those folders when they upload. So some sort of profile or, or scripted automation to set default values for common metadata properties significantly decreases the time it takes to upload assets and then have asset metadata ready for early, ready, readily available for people to use once the assets are in the system. So often these scripted uh, profiles apply to either uh, one folder or they apply recursively to many folders. So for example, if an asset is located in a parent folder that has something to do with the spring collection, then folders seven, seven layers deep should also have that spring collection tag applied as well without you having to go to each folder underneath and apply that tag as a default. So this is just something to consider as you are selecting or implementing a digital asset management system for your organization. So and then finally... Oh, sorry, oh, I was going to ask one question that came from the field because I think that it's, um, it's actually apropos here. Um, you're doing a great job of explaining the things that we need to consider from the operational standpoint, but on the infrastructural side, are you going to talk a little bit about whether um, your cusp, whether ASICS is using a cloud-based solution or an on-premises solution or some combination? Sure. Yeah, um, that is that is very um, pertinent to what we're discussing. So a lot of these pro processing profiles or scripts or automated tasks will rely on the speed and performance of the hardware. ASICS uses a cloud-based system. Everything's hosted on Amazon. Excellent. We find that a, lo a lot of our clients utilize cloud-based solutions for a variety of reasons, um, especially now that um, the security and the ability to connect to those cloud systems um, in a secure method is, is far more advanced than it was before. But specifically, ASICS uses Amazon to host their entire system. Thanks. Of course. And the last point I just wanted to make here um, is that these, the, anything that you do that scripts or automates the tagging of assets should really apply to each method that a user can upload an asset. So if you have users uploading assets through a browser, the same metadata functionality or automation should apply as when you upload through an FTP client. That's very important because uh, you don't want to have different support systems or trees for different users just because of the way that they interact with the system.
So second kind of discussion point here is how ASICS man manages and reuses assets across channels, geographies, and teams. So for this part, I'd like to hand it over to Kristen to say a couple things about the next few slides. Thank you, Paul. So you spend a lot of time thinking about your digital asset management system, thinking about how it's going to be hosted, thinking about some of the functionality. But one of the things that the business really needs to sit down and take some time to think about is looking at all of those assets. And one of the things that ASICs really did well, and we worked with them on this, uh, on different pieces of this, was they took the time to really look at uh, the scope of their assets and looked at their organization at a global level. And I think this is relevant to uh, many organizations who um, have products. Uh, and in this situation, um, I think if you're familiar with a, a, a pack shot, um, ASICS was finding that across the different regions, America, Australia, Japan, they were all doing slightly different um, product shots of the same product. So for example, uh, slightly different variation on the left angle of a shoe, slightly different shadowing. And so what they actually did is, as part of the system, uh, they decided that they were going to consolidate and did a full analysis and uh, reduce the number of pack shots. So what this did was it reduces the number of assets that have to be uploaded into your dam, and this reduces storage. And uh, with digital assets, the size of your assets can uh, grow significantly over time, and this was one thing that helps them reduce cost as well. So they went uh, down from each region having their own pack shot to a, uh, a global pack shot in order to um, simplify that and reduce the process and overhead. Uh, can you hit next, Paul? Um, in terms of the uh, number of assets spread across different locations, not only did ASICs have to look at it from a, okay, I've got assets living on um, a shared drive, I've got assets in a legacy dam, they also had assets spread across different regions. So. Uh, they also took the time to do a full analysis of uh, all of their products and where they could reduce where they were bringing those assets in from. So for example, uh, ASICS Japan and ASICS Australia have a really uh, high usage of reusing the exact same product. So instead of just bringing in everything um, into the digital asset management system, they decided, okay, we only need to bring in, you know, these products that we uh, use across all of the regions, and then we can consolidate to a single product for the ones that we share. Um, and when you have uh, such a large number of assets also spread across uh, different um, locations, what also ends up happening is you end up having you know, the PSD original, the JPEG, the PNG. I'm sure a lot of you have felt that pain and uh, another thing that you can do is use is to start thinking about tools um, and other ways to bring those assets in or to not bring those assets in. And one thing that I think a lot of digital asset management systems do is the ability to create a rendition. So in this example, uh, ASICs decided that they would stick to just uploading their PSDs or EPS files and then use the power of the digital asset management system to create those other renditions and to focus on just the renditions that they were being asked for over and over and over again from their retailers. And again, this reduces what uh, the number of assets that have to be uploaded as well as the overhead cost of storage when you're actually uh, limiting what you're going to provide on your, on your dam. Next slide. Um, so Did we miss one there? There we yes, go. There we go. Thanks. So this takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of investment uh, in terms of 
resources. Sometimes you have to do a complete content audit. Um, I just worked with a client where they brought in interns and they went through folder by folder in order to really only bring in the true assets that they needed to in the system. It is a worthwhile investment. If you just bring in everything, you're not starting from a good place. Uh, you're starting from where you were. Just everything's now in, in one big um, folder uh, or one big system. So uh, taking the time, investing in the resources uh, to go through and start off clean uh, is going to be worth it. Painful? Absolutely, but totally worth it. Um, and the other side of this isn't just your assets. It could also be the metadata. And so doing an analysis of uh, what metadata that you're going to bring in um, will also uh, allow you to think about the whole system um, from, you know, what you're going to bring in and who's going to be using it and making sure that you're uh, providing a usable experience when you're finished with your project. So speaking of metadata, One thing that ASICS also did was they looked across uh, all of the regions and wanted to also take that into a global solution. So uh, the digital asset management system that uh, they used um, uses uh, tags and they decided to go that route. Um, so a tag is a form of metadata that can be, uh, typically I describe it as it's a piece of metadata that is going to, going to be used across one to many assets using the same value. So in this respect, a product, so this shoe, is going to be um, used in AJP, but there's also going to be a thousand other shoes that are also going to be used by Japan. So we created a tag that we could apply to one to many of these uh, shoe images in order to deliver that content uh, to the Japan users. So uh, we worked, worked with ASICS to do a full analysis of, okay, these, this is the metadata that um, America uses and Australia uses and Japan uses. This is where you guys are using the exact same metadata, and this is where it deviates. And from there, we decided on a global and regional approach. And from that, we were able to um, drive assets uh, to different users based off of, I want to see everything that's footwear or I need to see just Australia's um, spring 2015 season. So using metadata can be um, really powerful, and when you're looking at a, a, a global or an organizational solution, having control over that metadata and taxonomy um, can really drive a, a good, consistent solution to the end users. And so at the uh, end of this presentation, I'll just do a, a quick demo of how we uh, use that in the system and how it really makes serving up the end product to either a retailer or to a website uh, much more efficient. Thanks, Kristen. Welcome. So in terms of an overall migration strategy, there are several things that you should not do and things that you should do. So first of all, do not assume that all existing assets are needed. And that can mean one of two things, or multiple things actually, but two things that pop into mind are, one, we've seen great success with phased approaches. And by that we mean bringing in perhaps all the assets that are used on a day-to-day -day basis at the time of migration, and then phasing in archived data. Could be the opposite depending on the way your business works, but phased imp imports or ingestion is, is, is important to at least consider. Also, do not assume that all variations of each asset need to be imported. As Kristen said, a lot of digital asset management systems allow you to create renditions on the fly or on demand or um, ahead of time, at the time of ingestion. And this can alleviate the need to, again, migrate all those different JPEGs or PNGs or web-friendly formats that you have lying around uh, manually. Second thing, do not forget to include legal or regulatory uh, groups within your organization if retention policies are needed in your industries. I came from Baron Engelheim, which was a pharmaceutical company, and I have to say that I have sat through some very long meetings about the comma placement in certain um, marketing material and that, and that sort of thing, and, and 
you can be assured that we spent a lot of time, including our legal department, when it came to the retention policies of assets. This is something that should not be um, kind of jerry-rigged into the system after it has already been started in terms of migration. So something that should happen up front. Do not forego a taxonomy planning session with your creative team. Oftentimes the tags that a creative team would use within Adobe Drive or Bridge um, or any other product that, that manages and maintains tags, um, that, that team should be consulted and ultimately have a final say in, in what tags are used to describe your entire um, asset structure. And then lastly, do not go into a project with the intent to migrate all your assets at, at once. And this goes to point number one as well. Uh, there are often times where this is necessary, and that's certainly, you know, can, that I mean, if it needs to happen, it needs to happen, but the, there are a lot of great successes you can have with a phased approach. And then, um, so things you should do are, you should definitely identify which metadata properties you intend to manage in your DAM. And by metadata properties, we mean not just tags, but all sorts of IPGC, XMP data fields that are pertinent to your business. Um, it's a little to describe a set of standards that, um, that are generic enough to apply to all organizations, but there are definitely subsets that should apply to all assets, like title, description. Do consider folder structure and a permission strategy that scales. A lot of times a company is um, uh, just for the lack of time to really put the upfront effort into a migration strategy it's very easy to migrate an existing folder structure. Um, perhaps you are kind of forcefully merging several different folder structures of assets into the same digital asset management system. And what that um, can cause is issues when you try to apply permissions down the road to those folders. Most times digital asset management systems will have some sort of permission structure, either at the folder, asset, or collection level. Uh, so that's just something that's really important to consider before you do a mass migration. And then, please, please, please invest the resources and time to consolidate your assets before the migration. As, as Kristen said, again, investing the time to actually consolidate your assets prior to migration as best you can, at least identify all the places where they can come from, is extremely beneficial and will save a lot of money down the road. So some of the organizational benefits that we saw ASICs achieve as well as other companies. So increased savings due to reduced effort to upload and tag assets. Again, you have multiple user interfaces to upload assets, so different groups can upload in the manner that they choose. But you don't forego the ability to apply you know, processing profiles or scripts in each method. Second, quicker time to market credited to high internal adoption rates. Again, this kind of goes to point one where if users are happy using a system, especially in the first couple weeks of using a new system, they're very likely to continue to use that system and not kind of fall on any sort of bad habits that they used prior. I think that adoption rates are, are sort of an uh, under-described, I guess, metric um, in terms of uh, the success of a system. And I think, especially just being in um, IT and in software development for a while now, I've seen that uh, a system is only good as the users that use it. And um, this is very true of a dance. That's a fantastic point, and I think that uh, I agree with you 100% that a lot of our uh, a lot of our um, our customers at Adobe and also uh, all of the other vendors out there have that same um, gap in knowledge, right? And I think it's if you take one thing away, measure the adoption so that you know that success is more than just how many searches did you do in the dam or how many assets were you able to get in there. Are your people using it? And if they're not using it, take that as an opportunity to figure out why and improve the system rather than let it sit there. Thanks, James. That's that is so incredibly true. Um, and then that leads into the third point, which is the ability to to focus on creative and spend more time. I mean, a creative team and then or a team that manages a creative team um, should not be spending half their day maintaining a digital asset management system. And, and really, nor should an IT organization when they should be 
hopefully focusing their time on addressing some of those opportunities that James was just talking about, if there are ways to improve the system, not, not maintain it necessarily. So we've migrated assets into a system, and um, we've talked at great length how we can consolidate assets before they're migrated into a system. But at ASICs, accelerating content creation and reducing waste within the system was a very important selling point when they were considering a dam implementation. So the first thing we talked about was uh, the, the use of ingestion workflows to provide content-ready assets. So by that we mean, let's say you have an original Photoshop file or something. This type of document may not be useful to most people in an organization. And so oftentimes we have to automatically create thumbnail images or PowerPoint-ready images that could be used in a variety of different situations within an organization. So a DAM solution generally provides these renditions automatically or some way to configure the creation of these renditions. And there are a variety of image libraries and there are a variety of different ways that this can be accomplished, but the general uh, takeaway from the clients we've worked with is the ability to upload the highest resolution possible of an asset and let the system take care of any renditions or variations that are lower resolution. Another key point that came into play with ASICs, especially when reporting on assets or measuring adoption rate and measuring utilization of the system, was that all asset metadata and comments that are made throughout a collaborative process that relate to an asset, uh, all are, are stored within the system as searchable information. So as assets make their way through any sort of creative workflow process or review process, users should be able to annotate and comment without affecting the original asset. A lot of times that data is, you know, you talk about non-destructive edits to an asset. This is something that is very important in the success of a dam. And since data is saved along with the asset for these notifications or these comments, then, then later on you can have notifications to other users or search um, um, that can expose this data uh, to other users in the system. And so kind of the visual you're seeing here is essentially that when someone adds an annotation to this particular image, and again, I think this, this applies to many damn systems, uh, it's very important that that data is stored within the system itself along with the asset as related metadata. And again, so why is this so important and why am I stressing it? Because in a dam, everything should be searchable, not just metadata applying to an asset or embedded in an asset, but also the metadata surrounding an asset or surrounding the process of creating an asset. And if everything's searchable, then you can create collections or smart, I think of um, iTunes smart playlists, oftentimes DAM systems offer the ability to create a, an auto-updating collection of assets based on some set of criteria. So in this case you could, um, and, and at ASICS we, we've implemented the ability to create collections of information that are related specifically for use across different regions. But just to, you know, again, not to belabor the point, but at the amount of information that you provide that is searchable within your system across all metadata fields will make that information easier to organize. And again, to go back to the adoption rates, I can tell you right now, and I'm sure I'm not the only person that feels this way, but if I can't find something on the first two pages of Google, it's very unlikely that I'm going to page three unless I am desperate. And I think that is true of many systems. And so the more information users have at their disposal to filter the assets that they need on a day-to-day -day basis, the better. Got that right. And finally, assuming everything's searchable and easy to organize, the system can also be, or should also be, easy to extend based on the needs of your users. So this goes back to the point that a dam often provides some sort of REST-based API or some API that allows external systems to build upon it. And this is what we did for ASICs as well in a variety of different ways. Um, and, and the first one, um, uh, I'll have Kristen discuss a little bit is the uh, duplicate checker. Kristen? 
Yeah, so one thing that we found with, um, with ASICs and most clients is duplicates. Um, as mentioned, uh, when initially looking at all of their assets, they've got um, the same assets stored on a Dropbox versus a shared drive versus a legacy DAM. So as diligent as you might be, or you know, maybe you are lacking in resources, you need to get your asset into the DAM. So um, the digital asset man management system that we're using did have a duplicate detection system. And some of these can be as simple as when you upload the same file into the same folder, just like on you know your your Mac or PC, it's going to be like, oh hey, did you want to upload that? Um, so there's there's that kind of feature of duplicate detection. That's just the same file name. The other is actually looking at um, the binary. So this is uh, where when you upload the asset, it's going to look for that asset somewhere in the system, and if it finds a binary match, it's going to notify you and say, like, hey, um, do you want to upload that? So that's great when you're doing just a small batch of uploads, 10 or 20 assets, and you can sit there and monitor it. But when you're doing a full migration, 10,000 assets, you don't want to sit there and, and wait for every duplicate to be notified to you. So what we wanted to do for ASICs was, was uh, provide a solution that allowed them to migrate their assets but not bring in uh, these binary duplicates or file name duplicates when it made sense. Um, so we created pretty much uh, a, a kick butt duplicate checker where uh, we um, created a script to look uh, during migration for any uh, binary assets um, and on finding them uh, did not move the asset uh, as part of the migration. So that was step one. And then that allowed uh, ASICs to go back and look at those and be like, oh yeah, we should upload that one or no, we should not. The other piece that we wanted to do is when you're uploading products into your system, they change from like season to season. So what ASICs requirement was is, okay, we uploaded um, this shoe um, for our last fall, but we're going to upload it again six months later, but we don't really know that we're uploading the same asset because we're uploading like three assets at a time. So uh, what we did is we set up a another kind of binary check that if it notifies that it's the same asset coming into the system, and this is for uh, a different situation, not a full migration, but just like a season upload of like, okay, take the uh, old asset, take all of its metadata, because there's a lot of valuable data that's already there, append it to the new asset that's being uploaded and, and stored in the new location. So that met ASIC's requirement because as they had a new product, they needed it to move through the seasons. So, you know, it's already was used for fall, now we want it in spring, but we want to know it was used back in the fall season. So it was really important, though, to not have two assets uh, living in the system, uh, but to follow the history and reduce the duplication. So uh, we really analyzed that and put together a solution that they're happy with to um, to keep you know their asset library down. Thanks, Kristen. So moving moving beyond duplicate check at the time of upload, um, oftentimes after an asset has been ingested in a system, there, there needs to be the ability to report on not only where assets are being used, but what assets need additional information in order to make their way through a creative or review process. So at ASICS, we, we utilized partially an out-of-the-box reporting framework, and then we also built and extended upon that with some, some sort of custom reports that allowed ASICS to identify which assets had metadata fields that were missing and um, ultimately the ability to generate these and send these, send these reports out to you know, um, group leads or, or management um, so that people can take the necessary steps to make sure that assets are properly tagged. Anything that couldn't be automated in, in, a, in, a, in an upload um, or as part of a script should be taken care of. perfect example of this is, let's say you have a photography um, folder that has pictures of specific people. Oftentimes you can automate 
you know, based on the folder where those photos were taken. There's often metadata embedded in the files themselves that describe that information. You can also probably automate the task of the event or, or what was happening at a given um, time when that when that was uploaded. But um, but then you you probably need an actual human to go in and tag assets for um, the type of person, the actual person who is in the photo. So these types of things, the reason why we're stressing this is that ASICs had a lot of duplication of effort before we implemented anything for them in terms of a DAM. And I think companies really face this challenge. And duplication of assets often means a significant amount of rework or, or duplicate work in order to create those assets. So if we can eliminate duplication at the point of ingestion and then make sure that all the assets that make it their way into a system have proper metadata and can be reported upon based on the metadata that's been captured as part of a collaborative process, we can certainly reduce that waste. So this is kind of what happens. So, oh, we decide that we ran a report and we already have that product shot and we already have that product shot in a particular angle that we need for, let's say, a shoe. Let's reuse it. This is great. But then the problem becomes, you know, how do we, is, is this, so we have an image, we have a high-res image, but, do, you know, is it optimized for mobile? Does, it, does the color profile match our standards? Um, there are a variety of different standards that each company will have related to their assets, specifically around color. And ASICs, like most companies, um, perfectly accurate colors across their different lines. And you can see in this, in this visual here how the colors are slightly different based on the color profile or the color space that are used, that's used. And this, this is very key to retailers or, or, to, or consumers who are um, utilizing their, their, um, their artifacts to create their own assets. Um, it could be the case that a person coming to the ASICS brand portal may not necessarily know what type of rendition they need. They could know, but perhaps they don't. So what we've tried to do is make sure that we automate a lot of this process so that we assign friendly names to things like fr underscore cmyk.psd so that the users, the actual consumers of these assets may not necessarily need to know what color space or profile or um, the intricacies of each file format um, they need. So ASICS utilizes a, an industry standard image library for optimization. And we apply color profiles to adhere to their brand standards through sort of automated workflows. So when, when assets are uploaded to the system, um, a variety of renditions are created automatically. Um, and not only that, but the renditions are, are, there are additional renditions that could be made available on demand later on. So often the DAM will have two different types of renditions, those created on the fly and those created ahead of time. But this process of configuration requires investing time in defining the right profile to meet the needs of uh, different consumers as well as um, a lot of back and forth to validate that the colors and everything meets the standards of the, of the brand. ASICs knew their client um, and their needs and, um, and provided a rendition set for them to use a variety of devices and different screens. Um, this is true not only, I, you know, I think the first, the first thing people think about is different devices, but I also think um, different types of consumers and their roles within their organizations play into this a lot. When someone's looking for an, a rendition of an asset for, let's say, a PowerPoint like this one, um, the, the standard for the, uh, the file format standard, it does not need to be the same as someone looking to create a 14 foot by 14 foot billboard, obviously. And so the, the users who download these images may not know that. They may not know exactly what um, they need. So it's very important to apply um, friendly labels to each rendition that is generated by a system. And we did that at ASICS. OK. So just the last part of this, um, I wanted to talk about the, the second part of these renditions that we're, we're discussing here, the ones that are created on demand. Um, most DAM systems allow you to create presets to deliver formats optimized for each channel. Um, a good example of this is video, but the same applies to static assets in the sense that 
Um, oftentimes, uh, now fortunately, if you live in a city, you have relatively fast LTE or faster inter, uh, internet on your phone, but um, not all people, not all consumers will have that um, luxury. And so you need to apply bandwidth restrictions um, to your strategy when you're trying to determine which renditions are available. And some sort of dynamic rendering system is, is extremely helpful. In the case of ASICs, most of the consumption is done via desktop, and then the creation of new assets are done also on desktop. But it's very important, um, specifically on tablet, as users are um, perhaps mobile when there's um, like a sales team or the retail a sales team, um, it's important that these show up vividly on retina devices as well. So the final portion of this discussion will talk about the delivery of assets. And um, ASICs, this was perhaps the most important part of the entire implementation for ASICs. So ASICs, like many, like many companies, needs to provide for a variety of dif distribution channels. So again, what that means is the audience could be very different. Um, audience, most majority of the audience for ASICs logs into the brand portal, which you see on the left here. But oftentimes, assets need to be delivered um, to specific clients or specific consumers via a specific channel, like FTP or an integration with a third-party system. Very often, we see the need to create a workflow that not only places an asset on a brand portal, but also a web-friendly format available for their e-commerce site, um, which happens in the case of ASICs. And then even further, there are times where some systems are, are more legacy with existing partners. So we've had situations where um, companies like Barnes and Noble and um, other other booksellers require FTP of the assets for book covers and, and other collateral information um, to be processed again via, via FTP or a shared drive. And so we recommend that this distribution happens in parallel and that it happens um, as part of an automated flow. Um, on the, on, what you're seeing here is basically a, a workflow that we've implemented where assets are not only pushed to an asset share or media portal, but they're also sent to an FTP. The number of clicks, again, adoption rate, the number of clicks a user needs to perform in order to send assets to multiple locations should be one or two. There's no real benefit to having them um, have to go through a series of steps just to do the same thing for different channels. So um, it's very important that if you are providing your own portal for people to download that you apply custom branding, so adhere to your brand standards. In the case of ASICs, uh, again, you'll see that this is branded very similar to their e-commerce site and allows for publishing of assets in a variety of different ways. And there are different filters, there are different uh, ability, ability to view the assets in different ways, like a grid or a list. Um, another key requirement for ASICs was the ability to personalize the experience. So when a user logs in, depending on their group or even the user, they're assigned a landing page. So that landing page could be generic, so everyone sees a generic landing page of all their assets, or it could be specific to that particular group. So what you're seeing here is the ability that when a sales rep in America logs in, um, the ability for that user to see the footwear page right away that for assets that only apply to America is very important. So they don't have to go through the se a sequence of clicks to actually see, to get to where they're always going to be um, or where, always where they want to be. So providing this personalization adds a nice touch for end users, again, to increase adoption rates and, or um, more to keep people coming back to the system. Additionally, oftentimes the high resolution original image is not available to all groups of people. Perhaps only your premier partners get access to the original, let's say it's PSD or high res tip, but you will allow access to PowerPoint friendly formats like um, you know, 1280 by 1280 or, or lower um, in terms of the, um, the resolution for, for particular use cases. So ASICs removed access to the original for users who signed up to the system and have not been directly approved by anyone at ASICs. And this is often a part of um, a impl uh, custom implementation of a DAM. And it, I think it's very powerful because not only can you protect individual asset types or renditions like this, but 
you can often stagger the release of an asset um, based on some sort of embargo period or an agreement that you have with particular partners. Very, very common. Um, and, and this happens in the case of ASICs where you want to deliver asset A to a smaller group of people before you release it to the general public. So these are all things to consider up front, but in, in terms of ASICs, they're, they're, they're very common in the sense that this situation applies to them. Okay, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Kristen um, to give a quick demo of the ASIC system. Thank you, Tom. And while we're switching over, uh, I'm going to ask a question or two that have popped up here. Uh, there's one that I that I think is interesting and relevant. Um, does ASICs use the dam for video? Video is really important for a lot of our customers, particularly in retail, uh, or not only our customers, but everybody who's uh, particularly in retail. Uh, and if they do, how do you approach metadata for those video file formats that are stored in dam? Yeah, we do. Uh, ASICs does. So they have two different types of video. They have the ones that they host on YouTube, and then they have the actual um, video assets that they upload and host in the dam. So if it's one that they host in the dam, then it's just treated just like the image of a shoe. It, ha it can have the exact same metadata and, and taxonomy applied to it and served up in this brand portal uh, via a thumbnail the exact same way. Um, obviously, if, uh, the movies are a larger file size, so you might have some more restrictions around uh, a consumer being able to download it. But using uh, different tools like Image Magic, we can also produce um, different, uh, sorry, FFmpeg. We can produce uh, different um, uh, transcoded versions of the video. So if you upload a video, I think you know you could get an FLV and uh, MP. I'm going to throw some acronyms out there, but yes, uh, so that was one option. And then to handle the YouTube um, uh, YouTube assets, those were important to also be able to serve those up, but they already have a really good location to store and get those out uh, to multiple audiences. So what we did for a workaround was really, um, I guess we kind of called a fake asset where we uploaded a text file. Um, to represent the video, and then we're able to use all of the same metadata that you would provide to any other asset. Um, and then that allowed them to appear to have that asset available in the digital asset management system and um, allow users to um, view the YouTube video right there from the system um, and go directly to YouTube um, from the brand portal. Cool. Well, we'll come back to other questions. We're really eager to see this um, uh, quick overview. Cool. So uh, what I have on the screen here is um, ASICs Australia. And I also am going to just switch over to another tab. I have ASICs uh, Japan pulled up as well so that we can just see the experience uh, of an asset being used in one-to-many regions. So for ASICs, it's really important that they have a log uh, a secure portal, so they have a login, and um, they have different ways to manage permissions for each region based off of what is um, needed, um, but that's all managed through the digital asset management system for the overall permissions. So I'm going to log in here, um, and I'm sure uh, for, uh, for other folks who have uh, product sensitivity, there's usually like an embargo or a release date, especially for something like a shoe. Um, where they don't want uh, images of that shoe to get released ahead of time, ahead of the you know release date. So that's a really important reason that they want to have a secure brand portal here. Um, that also goes back to that having staggered release date. They want to get that image out to um, to certain retailers who might be helping to mock up the release. But they don't want to release that image to everyone until later on. So. Those are all different controls through metadata that are, were really valuable to ASICs. So here in the brand portal, um, we talked about the different targeted experiences, so targeted navigation. Um, 
you know, based off of what system you're in. Um, it allows you to, you know, I'm logged in at the same user, but because I'm on Japan, I'm going to have a slightly different experience. You'll notice the layout is exactly the same. We're using, uh, we developed this as the exact same template and are actually using a language library to pull in um, whether the Japanese pulls in versus the Australian English pulls in versus the American English is pulled in. We really wanted to reuse and extend as much of the work we did as possible instead of having to build three, di three completely different sites that they had to manage for each region. So really taking that global approach to consolidate. So uh, here on the left hand side I'm just going to filter real quick for a season where I've mocked up a couple of assets. So we have two different shoes here and if I come over here to Japan I have just one of those shoes. So we've got the nice blue one here and I've got the orange one and the blue one here. So this is what as a uh, consumer of these assets this is the brand portal that I would come to uh, access them. Here on the system, I, uh, in my DM, I have these two assets, but I also have a third asset. And I'm going to come in here and work with the properties. And so this asset's already been uploaded for sake of time. It's gone through color profiles. It's had different renditions created so that it can support the end user. So I can come in here and in this respect, I'm going to give it um, a name. And you'll notice I have different metadata that I can apply based off of the region. Um, we've decided on this pro approach so that this single asset can be reused across different regions. And we'll continue to extend this as needed uh, to support the other two regions that come on board. And uh, we'll continue to solve for different language solutions as, we, as this um, digital asset management system grows. So here I can provide a Japanese title as well if I knew Japanese. And then the other thing here is taxonomy. So as mentioned, you can use metadata in many different ways to drive what is shown for an asset, making it searchable. And in this case, we use taxonomy to drive where an asset will be used. And then the user's permission will also determine if that user can see it or not. But here, I want to say that this asset is going to be available to AOP. So that's my Australia region. And the other thing that I want to do is I want to make it available to the Australia season. And this is where this asset could be used across multiple seasons and it would just have multiple tags. You would just build all of that out. So I'm just going to click done. Come back out here. I'm going to select this asset and I'm going to publish it out to my end users. So obviously there would be a lot more metadata that would go into an asset, but for uh, the simplicity of a demo, we're going to keep it real simple. So if I refresh here, come back into my season, that asset is now showing up for me and I have not tagged it for Japan. So if I were to come here and pull up Japan, it is not listed, but now Japan's ready to release that season. I can come back in, edit it. I want to release this to Japan. Let me just double check that. Yes. I'm going to republish my asset. Oops. And now I've just made this asset also available to Japan. I'll refresh my screen here. Go into the season I assigned it to. And now I can see my asset is available here. And you'll notice it's pulling my Japanese title versus on Australia. It's uh, not pulling, I didn't put in Australia title. 
So uh, I'm able to use the exact same asset and distribute it to my different users. Uh, and then by using that metadata on the asset, I'm able to limit the storage and all of those renditions are already created. And so, you know, I can choose to download this image as needed for uh, my Australia use. And if I was a Japanese user, you know, I could have even different restrictions for my user over there. So that covers um, just a little bit of, you know, really showing that this does work and that, you know, putting in that time um, and research and, you know, it does take some customization with any tool that you're going to be working with, um, but thinking about what it is that's going to be usable and effective for your end user and to save you um, time uh, and, you know, cost of resources and storage uh, will really make a difference in the long run. Paul? Cool. So um, looking at our clock here, we have come to the end of our program time, but there's questions in the question box that I would like to turn to. I'm hoping that the folks on the phone will be, you know, will stay with us. If not, of course, there's always a recording and you'll be getting that link to the recording in your email uh, sometime tomorrow. So don't worry if you miss on uh, the questions we're going to ask. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing the answers. And there's also a little bit of um, wrap-up presentation that's coming as well. So um, while you switch over back to the presentation, uh, is it okay if I ask some questions while we're doing that? Absolutely. Awesome. So there's one that comes in. It relates to the script for the, I think you called it a kick-butt duplication <laughs> system, and, and that was a fantastic uh, description. The question is about the scripts that's copying the metadata for a duplicated asset. Does it merge the metadata or does it replace it? It merges and appends. So, for example, if it, if this asset here is uploaded a month later, all of those tags I just put on it will be retained, and any new tag that might have been applied through um, the upload, the new migration process will be appended, and then there will be certain fields that will be overwritten with new data. With new data, but we've identified like append this one versus overwrite this one. Got it, um, uh, Paul. Uh, great. So we'll do that back. And another question has to do with the team size. How big is the team that manages this system, or even I think more specifically that manages the brand portal? That's an interesting question. Is there a management team for the brand portal? Do you even need it with the way you implement it? <laughs> yeah, so with ASICs, uh, they have pretty much two people per region that are dedicated to really um, the feed, um, feeding and caring for this. So it, it's, um, so for like ASICs America, there is one point person who really manages getting the assets into it in the process. So he's really invested in how the product works for both their end users and for um, him and his team. And I would say he works with about three people on his site to upload. Australia is a little bit smaller. So again, there's a point person there with a secondary backup, but he also has a few other people who are going in and um, they're really using the, the uh, the brand portal side to create collections and share those with retailers. And Japan, um, similar, one point person who's really managing it. And they're really getting um, user adoption out there. So I think we'll see over time. And then overarching all of that is that they have a lead um, at you know their ASICS headquarters who really owns this as a product for them. And we work with him to you know determine the, that we're on track with the overall global approach and um, whatever the next steps are for enhancements or future regions. So, you know, I would say on a every other weekly basis, we're checking in with, you know, three to four of their key stakeholders to uh, really uh, continue to, to maintain the system. Great. There's another question about the brand portal and um, looking at what you've created. Um, it doesn't look like a typical uh, Adobe Experience Manager brand portal. And so there's a question from somebody about, is this built from out-of-the-box components, or is it a highly customized uh, implementation, or is it somewhere in between? Um, it started with um, it started with extending 
out-of-the-box components. So these filters on the left-hand side, if anybody is familiar with that product, will look familiar to you. But from there, they really wanted a, um, a branded experience that matched, uh, you know, the, the ASICs website as well. But we did, you know, keep uh, a couple of the core functionalities, but beyond that, we ended up doing a lot of functionality that uh, the original Adobe product uh, couldn't do at that time. Got it. Well, that's great. Um, there's a question about language libraries. Um, someone wants to know which language library did you uh, arrive at or what do you use? And in particular, she's trying to work this out right now, so it's a very pressing question for her. Yeah, so with um, Adobe, there is um, two different features out of the box that we utilize. So there is a, a language dictionary, and Paul, if you have the more technical term for it, um, but it's I-18N, and it's actually manual translation. So uh, we worked with each of the regions to go through and determine all the places where they would want to have translation, and we mapped that into the components and templates. And then using the dictionary, they can go in and update the value there. And uh, we're not using, they're not, you know, they could be integrated with a translation service, but this isn't a large enough skill to do that at this point. The other piece that we're using is the out-of-the-box functionality of translating taxonomy or tags. And so that already has the option to go in and just add in another value for a different language. And again, that's just manually going in and adding in your Japanese version versus the English version or English Australia version. And um, so that really was just, just reusing core functionality and, and writing the code to map it in. Cool. Um, speaking of taxonomy, and this, there's a couple of questions here I'm going to consolidate. Um, is there a keyword catalog like there is in Bridge or in Lightroom? Um, and then secondly, that list of keywords, is any of it coming from the PIM? Mm -hmm. So when you were typing in to categorize, you were talking, you added in the tags, for instance, to what region? Uh, I think the question is where yeah. are those tags coming from and how do they get there? Are they are they hooked gotcha. up with XMP? You had showed us an XMP interface a while back from, I think, Illustrator. I was trying to gotcha. figure out what, what's the relationship between those two sets of tags. Okay. So with uh, AEM, um, or probably many other digital asset management sy systems, when you upload an asset, it can extract metadata um, that is embedded in the file. And so, uh, as long as there's a relationship, and I haven't done a project with that, that your, uh, I think, keywords uh, have a relationship with an existing tag in AEM, uh, I imagine that there could be some way that it could appear as a tag, but otherwise it's just stored as um, static metadata, and then, it, you know, you can use the tool to extract it in different ways. The metadata that, or the taxonomy that I was using was actually um, created, uh, you know, first we just spreadsheeted it out with the client and then we went in and actually created that within this digital asset management system to append to assets that are uploaded into the system. Once they're added to an asset though, it is stored on that asset, so if you were to download that asset later, that value is stored there as, as a, a metadata later. And in terms right. of XMP, Paul, I don't know if you have anything else you want to weigh in on that. Maybe not. Uh, I have one last question before we get to the key takeaways, um, and this is a question about um, the assets that are generated by the dam. Uh, in working with those derivatives, can you say that the quality of the system, the system created copies, is it qual is that quality as good as or better than those that might be generated by a Photoshop expert, or are we should we assume that automation means um, you get what you get? So uh, using a tool like Image Magic, you actually have a lot of control over the quality of what is extracted. So um, we were, I mean, as long as your starting point is a good resolution, good quality, um, you know, 
we're able to put in, uh, I was just working on a project where we were putting in different uh, qualities, uh, parameters for a PNG, transparency. Um, there's a really a lot of flexibility. Now, this isn't Photoshop where you're going to go in and, you know, be tweaking slight shading or, you know, or, you know, massaging a photo to look exactly how you want it or, you know, making a sunset look more beautiful. Um, so, you know, you are losing that control, but as long as your original, like, Photoshop file or EPS file is, is at a point that this is, this is our brand, this is what we want to serve to our client, uh, I think the system does a really good job uh, of uh, having the different uh, versions extracted being what you want them to be. Cool. All right, and now we have definitely come to the end of our time, so let's go and uh, wrap it up and uh, take it away uh, through share. Great. So uh, just to reiterate the key takeaways that we've been talking about, invest the time up front to solve for duplicates and metadata. Uh, this is an investment in your time and resources that, you know, as we mentioned, it's an upfront cost, but long term it will save you. Uh, and as a reminder, that's going to be in storage um, and, uh, you know, making things more findable uh, down the road and going to be a more uh, positive solution to your end users and the users working in the system. Utilize workflows to automate tedious ingestion and delivery tasks. Um, the system can do uh, a lot, especially when you're working with thousands of assets, um, and you don't want to go in and manually do that and, and be monitoring that, you know, day in and day out while you're doing a massive ingestion. Um, and also, you know, if you know that you're going to be, going to be, you know, in the situation of ASICs, you're, you're doing a season, and each region is doing a season, and that can range from 500 to 1,000 or more assets every few months. Um, you know, you really want to think about what is going to be efficient. And personalize and secure content to enable your consumer. Um, this really allows them, um, you know, in this instance of ASICs, they're going into a very branded experience. They're getting the assets that are uh, going to respect ASIC's brand once it's in that retailer's um, hand or the consumer's hand. And it also has that control so that um, your assets are not released or available um, to users who should not um, have them. Perfect. Well, um, I want to thank everybody for sticking it out. We went a little bit over, but I think it was time well spent. Uh, please do review the recording. There's a lot of good nuggets in there. Uh, I want to uh, thank Kristen and Paul for taking the time today to share with us some insights that they got from working with their customer. I want to remind everybody again, you're going to get this recording by email. Damn Europe's coming up in London the 28th and 29th of the month of June. So if you are in the region, Go ahead and sign up now. Uh, not only will you get content like this, but you'll have the opportunity to view it and experience it face-to-face -face with our great presenters. So thank you very much for your time. We look forward to seeing you in London or in a webinar coming up soon. Thanks so much.